Hello and welcome once again to Tales of the Wild, the podcast where we explore the lives of the most unusual living creatures we share this planet with in the form of stories. Through stories we can gain insight into the otherwise alien world of our very distantly related animal cousins following a narrative. This is something we ourselves have evolved to do to retain information. While the stories are heavily based on scientific fact, I will sometimes anthropomorphize, that is, to project human characteristics onto the animals, to add relatability and keep the stories engaging. If you can forgive this creative license, you should be able to learn a lot while relaxing and enjoying the story. Imagine for a second you're a member of the plankton of the ocean. We've all heard about plankton. We know that they're tiny, microscopic organisms floating around in the water, and we probably know that they form the basic diet of many other species, such as fish or even the largest mammals on the planet, which is the whales. We think about how incredible it is that such a large animal can consume enough of these microscopic organisms to sustain itself. But have you ever really wondered what plankton are and what it is they're doing? We tend to think of them as bacteria or some other kind of microorganism that's so small and different to the world we're familiar with that we couldn't possibly understand what they do during their lifetimes. We're going to try and change that right now. Welcome to Tales of the Wild. We're way out in the open ocean. As we sink below the surface, the water is lit up by beams of smoky light scattered by thousands of microbubbles and the dusting of microorganism clouds that live below the surface. A huge shifting cloud without color and without defined borders is being pulled and contorted slowly in the moving currents of the salty water. This material is what we know of as plankton. The term plankton comes from the Greek word to mean drifter. Very few people really know what this mysterious substance is. The term plankton is an oversimplistic and a somewhat understandable attempt to cast a broad net over a whole group of vastly different and highly complex mix of organisms. Despite the oversimplification of the term, plankton at least unifies them by one defining characteristic, and it's useful in doing so. They're all drifters. They all appear to be at the mercy of the ocean's currents. Unlike a colony of ants, they're not always working together, in most cases rather the opposite. Many are at war, but they do drift together. While generally drifting, it should be kept in mind that not all plankton are unable to move at all and also not all plankton are microscopic. Jellyfish, for example, are considered a type of plankton, and they're neither microscopic and they have their own methods of locomotion. So what really are plankton? They're made up of roughly five groups, which are surprisingly similar to what we see on land at the macroscopic level. The same functions are fulfilled. There are the equivalents of plants, herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, fungi, bacteria, and viruses, all sewn together in a highly complex and long-evolved web of interactions. The grasses of the plankton world are known as phytoplankton. They usually drift near the surface of the ocean to maximize their energy harvesting potential. Algae is an example of a phytoplankton, as well as many cyanobacteria species. Some of these do have limited movement capabilities, particularly when traveling vertically, and this is important because they feed on sunlight, which with diminishing intensity penetrates to about 200 meters of depth into the sea. Whenever a life form gathers energy from the sun, there's always something else which wants to exploit this stored energy resource. The name of this group is zooplankton. This includes what are analogous to herbivores, which feed on phytoplankton, and also carnivores, which are feeding on those herbivores. And of course, there are omnivores which feed on just about anything they can digest. Another group is the fungi of the plankton world. These plankton are known as mycoplankton, 
And just like the fungi we see on land, they have essential roles in nutrient recycling. The final two groups include the smallest plankton species, and these are the bacterioplankton and the viroplankton. They are essentially bacteria and viruses which thrive in the underwater environment, interacting with all of the other organisms there. So just to quickly summarize, plankton are organisms which are generally, but not always, microscopic. They all drift with the currents in the water, although some have limited local motility. They can be separated into groups of phytoplankton, zooplankton, mycoplankton, and bacterioplankton and viroplankton, depending on their physical characteristics and the ecological niche they fulfill in their aquatic environment. I'm not going to touch on the topic of aeroplankton, but just to be aware that there are plankton which drift in the currents of air as well. For this episode, we'll focus on just one species of plankton that only spends a brief phase of its entire life cycle as plankton. It was a crowded hatching. Thousands of tiny organisms pulled out into the ocean. He looked so peaceful, floating among the other plankton, moving gently in the currents. Of course, whether it is peaceful or not is a matter of perspective. Within the cloud of plankton, a war rages on. Individuals are jostling for survival. But it's a peaceful war a kind that we're not familiar with on our macroscopic scale. There's a meditative quality to the plankton as they bob up and down in the currents, accepting their fate. While most plankton will end up being eaten, we are tracking a lucky plankton. He's sibling number 243 out of 16,000. Two four three was drifting with the other plankton in the ocean currents. He observed his siblings getting eaten all around him. He had no connection to them and he felt, therefore, no sense of loss. He simply observed what was happening around him. It was, after all, very difficult to develop bonds when you have 15,999 brothers and sisters. But in any case, when you're surrounded by death and danger and you have no control over yourself, you learn to lose your fear and to accept your fate, whatever that might entail. He knew he was very vulnerable, but he also knew that this was okay. This tiny plankton is actually the larval form of a hermit crab. In his current larval form, which is known as a zoea, he looked like a partially translucent shrimp. He had a rostrum, or a nose, that points downwards towards the ocean floor like a long beak, and this beak lay in the middle of two disproportionately large dark compound eyes. If you remember from the Black Shield Hornet episode, compound eyes are split into cells called omatidia, and while they don't have the best resolution, they have a very wide viewing angle and the ability to detect fast movement. This is very important in an environment full of predators, or rather it would be later on in his development. He was only about 0.2 millimeters in length. The only control he had was operating two long dangling appendages attached to his body. These appendages are called maxillipeds and they resemble very long arms which end in fans of a fine mesh. One of the very few abilities he had in his current form was to sweep these oversized appendages through the water to collect floating debris and feed it into his mouth. He enjoyed the feeling of water resistance running through the webbing of his maxilliped fingers, and he used them frequently to feed. To us, he looks very odd, and unlike anything we see on the macroscopic level. We can't relate to or understand a creature like this, so strange in form and with those large, lifeless compound eyes, so it makes us feel uneasy, but also a bit curious. Despite his small size and apparent vulnerability, 243 is the most successful form for the ecological niche he fulfills. Any genetic deviation from this form would almost certainly result in death, but also in some exceptionally rare cases, particularly during times of environmental change, a mass evolution of the species. As 243 observed the world around him, it was flickering with the life and death of thousands of other plankton. Some were eaten by larger plankton, and others fell into blurred, fast-moving shadows. 
It was really quite a show and it made him sleepy and he started to drift off into a deep sleep. As he drifted off, he had the familiar sensation of forgetting where his body ended and the external environment began. He was exactly the same temperature as the seawater. It was a peaceful and relaxing feeling and he felt totally in balance with the universe. He awoke some time later with quite a different feeling. His skin felt like it was tightening around his body and putting a lot of pressure on his chest and on his large eyes. It was painful and he didn't know what was going on. It became more and more intense and he felt like he was going to burst. As he tensed his maxillopeds in pain, his entire skin along the back started to split open with a loud crack and it ripped all the way to his tail. It came to him as a shock but also a huge relief as the pressure was now gone. He wondered for a second if he had died. But he didn't feel dead. He wriggled his legs to free them from the now loose pale skin that they had previously been enclosed in. Now the very pale translucent skin floated next to him as one piece. It almost looked like another Zoia floating next to him. This was the first time he'd really seen what he looks like. He was observing his strange form in the skin floating next to him when one of his maxillipeds instinctively caught it and fed it into his mouth and he ate it automatically. That was weird, he thought. It took him a while to reach that blissful state he had been in for the past few days, but eventually he got there and he was back to floating, feeding and meditating in the ocean currents. Just a few days later, the same thing started to happen again. This time he was prepared though, as he felt that familiar sense of bloating inside his body, he tensed his muscles to break the skin. This released the pressure and he molted the next skin and entered a new phase of larval development. He didn't much like this new feature of existence, but he'd learned to accept it. The molts continued again and again, and then on the fifth time, something very strange happened. When he emerged from the skin, his form had changed quite dramatically. He no longer had the long pointed rostrum and his feeding maxillopads had also been replaced by two very large claws. Particularly the right claw was very large in size. Also something quite disturbing was happening. He was slowly sinking out of the planktonic cloud and deep down towards the ocean floor. This new form is known as a Glaucothoa. You can think of this state as being a miniature hermit crab. And when I say miniature, I really mean it. He's only about two millimeters in length. This was the first time he would touch solid ground and he instinctively spread out his five pairs of legs to get a good grip on the surface he was about to land on. He landed delicately next to a small shrimp, which immediately began to investigate him by tapping its strange alien antenna and long legs against his back. What a fascinating creature, he thought, as he reached up his right claw and severed it in half. Shocked by what had just happened, he looked at his claws briefly, and then at the decapitated shrimp, which floated off with the currents, still tapping its legs and sending out small clouds of a dark fluid. He would need to learn how to control these things before they got him into trouble, he thought to himself. He practiced walking along the seafloor. His oddly curled abdomen dragged a line in the sand, and he tripped over his large claws several times. It didn't take him long to learn to raise his claws and abdomen to move more efficiently. After the two claws, his next two pairs of legs were large and strong and responsible for most of his movement. The next two pairs were more like fingers and offered supplementary locomotive support. Soon he was scuttling along the seabed with precision and control, something he'd never experienced in his life and something he was learning to enjoy. He proudly snapped his claws above his head and raced in the direction of the shallows. It wasn't long before very suddenly everything went black. He instinctively froze with his claws snapping up to the sky. As the light flicked back on, he saw the tail end of a spotted eagle ray swimming into the distance. It must have been attracted by the smell of that dying shrimp. Luckily for 243, he'd been much too small for the eagle ray to be interested in eating him. If he'd been any larger, or the eagle ray had been smaller, he would certainly have stood no chance against it. He suddenly felt very insecure. 
he had an increasingly strong feeling of being naked, vulnerable and exposed. He began wandering around on the seafloor, cowering from the shadows when they appeared. He didn't know consciously that he was looking for a shell, but coded into his very DNA was this desire. His survival, and the survival of his ancestors, had depended on a drive to find an appropriate object to cover and protect his body. Some crab species hit the evolutionary lottery and were born with a shell to protect themselves from predators and the environment but hermit crabs needed to find one themselves. As he moved through some thick grass on the ocean floor, he could hear a lot of crunching sounds coming from over a small ledge. He slowly peered over the edge with his eyes that were conveniently placed on the top of stalks, and he saw a pair of crabs enjoying a meal made up of tiny snails. As soon as he saw the snails, he was mesmerised. What an incredibly smooth porcelain structure. He instinctively wanted to be close to them, but he knew he was on the menu for those crabs. They were big, ugly brutes. One of them was missing an eye, and the other had a deep battle scar running along its carapace. These two ruffians were certainly no strangers to battle. They were chattering away to each other, occasionally pushing or snapping at each other with their giant claws as they recklessly vandalised those beautiful shells. 243 tried to leave the area for his own safety, but he could not get the thought of those smooth protective shells out of his mind. He ignored his better judgement and walked slowly over the ledge. As he approached, one of the crabs spat out a mouthful of mashed up snail and twisted a stalky eye in his direction and froze. Just a split second later, both of them were scuttling along the seabed towards him at an alarming pace. But 243 was too quick and backed up behind the seagrass again. The crabs decided not to bother searching and went back to the snails and started cracking open more of them and eating the soft innards. Every time a shell cracked, 243 felt it in his core and shuddered. Those destructive vandals have no idea what damage they're doing. The crab's strange plated mouths twitched horizontally as they ate, and their antennae flicked with delight as they consumed these small morsels of snail meat. 243 could do nothing but watch. In the end, there was only one good shell left, and one of the crabs picked it up. 243 could not bear it and rushed in again to try and rescue it, but the crab dropped it immediately and ran after him. Again, 243 backed away behind the grass, knowing that he would have no chance against one of these barbarians. When the crabs walked back to the shell, one of them picked it up. 243 could see it was empty. Out of frustration, the crab crushed the shell between the jaws of his large claw, dropped it and walked away with the other crab. What a waste. As soon as the coast was clear, 243 moved out from behind the seagrass and ran over to the snail shell. The shell was so damaged it would not make a good home. He ran to inspect the pile of snail shell remains. None of them were still intact. It was already getting late, so with great disappointment he searched for a safe place to rest for the night. With the night comes many threats at the bottom of the ocean. It was very difficult to find a safe place to sleep. Every crevice of every rock was occupied, and for some of these inhabitants, 243 was a good meal, so even inspecting these crevices came with its own risks. He had no choice but to wait where he was, next to the seagrass, and hope for the best. It was a long night. 243 could feel the currents of large fish swimming close to him, possibly eels. His best defence right now was probably his very small size, which took him off the menu of many of these nocturnal predators. He didn't sleep, partly out of fear and partly because hermit crabs are actually nocturnal, and so even though he was exhausted, it felt unnatural for him to sleep now. He watched the light of the moon through the ripples of the water's surface. It reached down to the seagrass he was hiding in and lit up the environment with an eerie glow. Thought about how much his life had changed, He could imagine the plankton now floating in the light of the moon. What a blissful state that had been when he didn't have a care in the world. He watched the moonlight as it cast warping and twisting shadows from the moving seagrass. 
He tried not to let his imagination play tricks with him as he watched these shadows. He waited for hours, naked and afraid, watching the shifting light. He wasn't cut out for the stress of this world. It seemed like all of his luck had run out. He was starting to wish that he had just been eaten as a plankter when he noticed something about the seagrass which he hadn't seen before. It wasn't as empty as he thought. Thousands of oddly familiar shapes covered the tops of these blades of seagrass, and to his delight, he realized that these were all tiny snails. That's where those snails came from, he thought. They were feeding on the seagrass. With renewed excitement, he began to search the base of the seagrass, almost forgetting about the threats lurking around every corner. After more searching, he found the perfect shell. It was just like the one that the crab had destroyed with its claw. His strange asymmetrical curled tail corkscrewed perfectly into the shell like a twisted glove. With a renewed feeling of security, he could finally get some rest. He curled up inside the shell and began to drift off. His joy at finding a suitable shell had made him forget how easily those crabs had crushed the shells just like the one he was in now. As he rested, he began to dream. He dreamt about a time 251 million years ago, where a series of three phases of unprecedented volcanic eruptions spewed gases and magma from the earth into the atmosphere. The toxic clouds filled the lungs of many terrestrial species, killing them immediately. The high levels of carbon dioxide acidified the ocean, killing most marine life. He watched with horror as monsters of unimaginable proportions began to fill the vacant niches left behind in the wasteland of this extinction event known as the Great Dying. Evolution and diversification was rapid. Some of the survivors of this tragedy were shelled marine snails. For these individuals, the abundance of food caused by the absence of their previous competition caused them to explode both in numbers and species. This huge increase in diversity in numbers of shelled gastropods, which is the snail group, gave rise itself to an explosion of shell-crushing predators. 243 dreamt of a particularly terrifying monster called an ichthyosaur. It resembled a dolphin, and it was a cold-blooded reptile. In the dream, he watched over time as the ichthyosaur terrorized his crab-like ancestors. Then he watched his great ancestor, a decapod, which is a ten-legged lobster-like organism, split into two groups, the true crabs and the false crabs. This happened about 240 million years ago. Before his eyes, the true crabs and the false crabs, which both at this time resembled modern lobsters, underwent a similar process called carcinization, which means to become more crab-like. This process involved the tails, which are known as pleons, becoming shorter and more folded underneath the body to protect the vital organs they contained from these predators. In the dream, this process of carcinization occurring in two separate species independently was known as convergent evolution. But the dream didn't go into more detail about this because it will be covered in a future episode. The body of the true crab and the false crab became wider and flatter and more difficult to pluck off the rock surfaces. Then he watched as the true crabs developed harder carapaces, which protected them from predators, and left the false crabs behind. After millions of years of destruction, he watched with pride as his early primitive ancestors learned to drag the snail shells they were hiding under for protection with them. Then with amazement, he watched the form of the body of his ancestors change to better fit inside these snail shells, and now they could be carried on the back of his kind. He felt proud of what the hermit crabs had learned to do over the years, and as this sense of pride was rising in him, he felt like he was literally rising up out of the water. In the dream, he began to float up into the planktonic cloud once again. It was then that he opened his eyes and realized that he was literally being lifted off the ground. He poked his arms and legs out of the shell, and as his eye stalks popped out of the opening, he came eye to eye with one of the shell-crushing crabs. The crab was as shocked as he was and dropped the shell. 243 used the chance to escape and ran away from the area as quickly as he could. 
Fortunately, the crab had quickly found another snail-filled shell and was too busy eating this piece than to care about prey that required more effort. As a side note, while tool use is often reserved in our minds for the more cognitively advanced species, this shell use could arguably be considered a form of tool use by an invertebrate. They're utilizing an object that they find in their environment to increase their chances of survival. This is like how our own ancestors used the skins of mammals they hunted as clothes to increase their mobility and survival in colder climates. Similarly, hermit crabs have used the shells of snails to allow them to venture out of their burrows to forage more freely in an environment full of predators. Additionally, it means that they don't have to invest their own biological resources into the production and maintenance of their own shell. Genes associated with finding suitable shells are being hardwired into the genome of this species because of the huge evolutionary advantage it provides. Being reminded that he was still vulnerable gave 243 the motivation he needed to reach the shallows. He had only just started marching in that direction when he looked up and noticed something drifting towards him. It was another small Glaucothua, much like himself. It landed next to him, and it looked very vulnerable and afraid. 243, knowing how terrified he had been without a shell, wanted to help out. He pointed towards the tall seagrass where the snail shells were, but the other hermit crab just stared fixated on his shell. 243 felt immediately and extremely possessive and his eyes narrowed and he started to back away. His outstretched claws began to snap aggressively towards this naked individual. The naked hermit crab turned and quickly ran away, looking back occasionally. 243 continued his march towards the shallows, but this time he had the distinct feeling that he was being followed. One of the disadvantages of carrying a shell was that you can't see directly behind you. He shook the feeling off and started to look for food. He was getting hungry. The way marine crabs and hermit crabs find their food is by smell. They do this by flicking their antennae back and forth, trapping fluid in the spaces between the hairs during the rapid downward stroke and holding the water sample during the slower return stroke. This clever trick of fluid dynamics, where they can either take a new sample of water or hold it by changing the speed of antennae movement, allows time for smells to be detected in the aquatic environment. He detected the smell of something decomposing to the west. It wasn't exactly on his route, but it wasn't far away. So he made his way to the smell and saw a decaying fish there. He immediately climbed on top of it and started feasting. After a few minutes, the eagle ray he'd seen before arrived, and he barely got out of the way before the ray swallowed the entire dead fish up whole. Still, he had managed to eat a lot before this happened, and he settled down to digest it. As he lay there, he began to feel sleepy again and drifted off into the dream he was having earlier. One of the ichthyosaurs was inspecting him, but this time he was a giant hermit crab. He was laughing at this tiny ichthyosaur who seemed so small and weak against him. It gave up trying to bite through his shell and started to tug at his arm. 243 was still laughing and was about to cut the little dinosaur in half with his oversized claws when he awoke to find the naked hermit crab he had chased away earlier, pulling suddenly and sharply at his claw. He lost his grip and slipped out of the shell. The naked hermit crab jumped right inside and ran off. 243, angry and terrified, ran after him and tried to get the shell back. The thief turned around and confronted him. As the claws of 243 failed to get a good grip on either the shell or the claws of the thief, the thief had better luck and severed one of 243's ten legs. In shock, he retreated and recognized that he had no choice but to let go of his beloved shell. He was no match for this individual. He ran frantically around looking for a new shell, but he had no luck. He was homeless once again and vulnerable and bleeding from the stump where his leg used to be. The blood leaked out like blue ink. It was blue due to a large quantity of an oxygen transporting protein called hemocyan. As a side note, this type of blood has become very valuable in the pharmaceutical industry. 
to the point where it's worth $60,000 per gallon, or about $16,000 per litre. This blood is milked from horseshoe crabs, which despite the name are more closely related to spiders and scorpions. The animal's blue blood provides the only known natural source of limulus amabocyte lysate, which is a substance that detects a type of bacterial toxin that causes the blood to clot. Before many medicines are deemed safe for human consumption, a sample is mixed with this blood to see if any clotting occurs, which would indicate that there was some kind of toxin present. Because of this incredible ability of the blood to identify toxins, so many have been harvested over the past couple of decades that their numbers have actually declined. In recent years though, conservation efforts have ensured that the numbers are starting to increase again. 243 wasn't too concerned about the lost limb. He still had nine legs and he also knew that he would regrow the one that was damaged. It was his lack of a home that really disturbed him. He was extremely vulnerable outside of the shell and the trails of blue inky blood that were leaking from his missing limb were sure to attract some predatory attention. He began his journey back to the patch of seagrass where he had first found a suitable shell. He saw those crabs again, munching on the snail shells. This time, partly out of desperation, he grabbed a partially damaged shell and slid inside it and escaped as quickly as he could. It was risky to be wearing a damaged shell like this, but much better than nothing. When he was in a safer location, he inspected the shell. It had the telltale hole on the back, indicating predation by a marine vampire. These vampires are known as dog whelks, and they're a type of marine predatory snail. They creep up on sleeping snails, crawl on top of the shell, and excrete a shell softening solution onto the shell. Once the shell has become soft, they then bore through the surface using a specialized saw edge of their radula, which is the tongue-like organ that snails have. Once they'd made this small hole, they inject digestive enzymes into the shell and suck out the resulting escargotic soup. It's the nightmare of all gastropods. 243 shuddered at the thought of this and hoped that his new shell was not haunted in any way. It didn't feel like his previous home. This one was tattered and chipped and seemed to drag against the current as he walked. He continued towards the shallows. Over the next few days, he began to feel increasingly weak. Something was wrong with his health. He was lethargic and sleeping much more than he should have been. It seemed to be taking an eternity to reach the shallower waters. He decided to take a risk. He crawled out of his shell to inspect it. To his horror, he saw many small creatures crawling around inside. They were minute parasitic isopods. He inspected his body and saw a larger isopod attached to him. It was just out of reach of his claws and no amount of twitching or rubbing against the sand removed it. As a school of small fish started to come towards them, attracted by the commotion, 243 had no choice but to jump back inside his parasite-infested shell. His body was now itching, and just knowing what the problem was made it so much worse. He knew he couldn't survive much longer like this, but he had a plan. He set out to find some food. It didn't take him too long to find the body of a decomposing eel wedged under a rock. This one was very difficult for larger scavengers to access, so he should be able to eat in peace. He ate much more than he would have liked to, and slept next to the eel, only to wake up and continue eating. The parasites on his body seemed to enjoy this new lifestyle, and grew much larger with the influx of nutrients. After a couple of days of feasting, he felt very bloated, and began to feel the familiar sensation of his skin tightening around his body. This is what he had been waiting for. He left his shell and buried himself into the small burrow underneath the sand, and then he tensed his whole body. Like a crustacean equivalent of the Hulk, he groaned as his muscles tensed and his skin split all the way along his back. He wriggled out of it. The skin removed was covered in small isopod parasites, which were unaware of their impending doom. 243's claws automatically gripped the skin and he began to eat it, including those parasites. They were promptly killed by his claws, jaws, and stomach acid. He felt a huge relief as all of the itching disappeared, 
but his new skin was very sensitive and very vulnerable, and so he remained buried in his burrow by the decomposing eel and waited for his skin to harden again. He emerged a day later and inspected his shell carefully, checking for any more isopods before climbing back inside. It felt like a much tighter fit this time, and even though it was parasite-free, the chips and cracks were quite uncomfortable against his skin. He was determined to find that hermit crab that stole his shell and take back what was rightfully his. He dragged his shell away from the decomposing eel and continued walking in the direction of the shallows. After some time, he spotted on the horizon what seemed to be a big group of hermit crabs. There must have been about 50 of them. He moved with increasing speed towards the group. He then stopped and watched from a distance. Something very strange was happening here. The hermit crabs seemed to be organising themselves into a long line. At first it was chaos, and they were crawling all over each other and moving backwards and forwards. But then some order was established, as the smallest individuals, which were about the same size as 243, lined up on one side, and the larger hermit crabs lined up on the other side. They were sizing each other's shells up, and they were about to take part in what is known in the hermit crab world as a vacancy chain. This rather common event in the hermit crab world begins when a hermit crab needs to upgrade its home due to the increasing size of its body. When they find an empty shell, even if it's not a suitable upgrade for them personally, they wait patiently by it, and eventually on seeing this, other hermit crabs in the area will come to join. Then what happens is they organize themselves by size, the idea is that the largest will move into a vacant large shell, freeing up its own shell, which is then occupied by the next largest hermit crab, and this continues along the chain until even the smallest hermit crab has relocated into a new shell. It's generally quite civilised, but becomes less so when there are many hermit crabs or shells of equal size. At the lower end of the chain, 243 immediately recognised one of the smaller hermit crabs as being the thief that had stolen his shell. He looked at his previous home with great envy. This was his chance. He sneaked up closer to the line, but kept himself hidden from the thief so as not to be noticed. He saw a few eyes looking at his tattered shell as he walked past, and then they looked away in disgust. The vacancy chain event was about to start. The largest hermit crab at the front slid out of his shell and jumped into the new larger shell. Then immediately the second largest hermit crab did the same thing. The relocation travelled down the chain until the thief was just about to jump into the new vacant home in front of him. At exactly that moment, 243, with all of his energy, leapt out of his shell and shot inside the thief's anticipated upgrade. He looked smugly at the thief, who recognised him with shock. The thief then, in a state of panic, tried to get back into his old shell, but this one was now occupied, and the new occupant was snapping his claws angrily at the thief. 243 was delighted with what had occurred. It could not have gone better, and he snapped his own claws in anticipation of the best part which was still to come. As all of the shells were now occupied, the hermit crabs began to leave. 243 watched as the thief had no choice but to squeeze into the tattered old broken shell that he had left behind. As he crawled away with this tattered broken shell, he looked back at 243 with what must have been pure hatred. This was a great day for 243, and finally he had some luck. He continued his journey to the shallows with much more energy and in a much better mood. A few days later, after a lot of marching, the submarine conditions had become very poor. Strong sideways currents combined with murky clouds of loose sand were scrubbing the ocean floor clean of any food scraps and making it very difficult to navigate. At one point, 243 had become completely lost in the underwater blizzard, but judging by the amount of empty hermit crab shells he'd found, he must be going in the right direction. It didn't seem strange to him at the time that there would be so many empty hermit crab shells in this otherwise empty patch of sand. He was very glad to have the protection of his new shell. He clawed his way forwards against the strong current, occasionally pausing to rest. Strange that there were no plants around here. It was almost absent of any life. 
He had a strange feeling about this place and he decided he would try and get out of here as quickly as possible. Just as he started to move, he heard something on the ocean currents. It sounded like some kind of distress call. Help me, it said. Curiosity got the better of him, and he moved off his path in the direction of the call. He had a bad feeling about this. He could see a thin, shadowy line dancing in the currents, beckoning him towards it. An ominous feeling crept over him. Help us. This way. They said. 243 crawled a little closer, despite a creeping fear taking hold of his crustacean body. He found himself quite enthralled by the delicate movements of these dancing vertical lines. On closer inspection, there were exactly five of them. Five small, thin, banded, tentacle-like beings moving around in the sand. It was captivating, and judging by their size and shape, they would make quite a nice meal for a hungry hermit crab. Thank you. Closer. This way. Come this way. 243 didn't have to be asked. He didn't trust these creatures, but he was much bigger and stronger than they were. He would enjoy crushing them up with his claws and eating them. He'd become very hungry in this wasteland. He took one step forward. Then another. Then he hesitated for a split second and the entire ground beneath him started rumbling. The five tentacles emerged to reveal two large bony teeth jaws of a giant bobbit worm. The jaws were held wide open like two reaper sides. The creature shot towards 243 at such a pace that he couldn't move. The bobbit worm's jaws snapped shut on his shell and rocketed him skywards against a cloud of sand which scratched against his skin. The force of the sandy salt water threatened to rip him right out of his shell but he held on tight. The upwards velocity stopped abruptly and then reversed. He was soaring back down towards the earth at a phenomenal rate, dragged down by his clamped shell. He didn't have time to react before he was plunged into darkness. He was pulled a meter downwards towards the bobbit worm's lair when he stopped. It was pitch black and suddenly very silent, apart from the creaking of his flexing shell as it resisted being crushed between the two jaws of the bobbit worm. These segmented predatory worms can reach up to 3 meters in length and they lie vertically in the sand with only their head protruding before ambushing passing fish and crabs. 243 was in serious trouble and he had to act. If the jaws didn't crush his shell, he would certainly suffocate down here. He felt around with his legs and he identified what must have been one of the tentacles that he'd seen earlier. Without a second thought, he gripped it between his claws the bobbit worm let out a howl and violently shot down into the black abyss below. 243 saw the tentacle in his claw, it was still moving. He could hear the rumbling bobbit worm coming back up to take its revenge. He burrowed into the side of the tunnel just in time as the bobbit worm shot past him upwards out into the open sea. Its moving body sealed him in the side tunnel he'd made and he could do nothing but wait. It was the longest 20 minutes of his life, but finally the worm started moving downwards again. As it shot downwards, 243 came face to face with the eyeball of a large, terrified looking fish trapped in the jaws of the worm. As the fish was pulled further down into darkness, 243 used the opportunity to start climbing up out of the tunnel. He emerged exhausted. He needed to get away from here as quickly as possible. Nowhere was safe. Everything was trying to eat him. Life continued like this over the next few weeks for 243. He spent his time eating and avoiding being eaten and upgrading his shell. He'd grown substantially in this time and was now about the size of a tennis ball when he finally reached the shallow waters of the shore. His size meant that he now struggled to find suitable snail shells to protect his body, so upon reaching the beach he'd resorted to using the remains of a coconut shell, which was not the optimal shape, but it was tough enough and covered his body. 
He spent an increasing amount of time exploring the beach, which seemed to be full of the type of food he liked. When he first left the water, the burden of his new body was enormous. Weight in water is equal to weight out of water, minus the weight of the amount of water displaced. So if the body of 243 displaced a tennis ball volume of water, which is about 150 cubic centimetres, and each cubic centimetre of water weighs 1 gram, then he was carrying an additional 150 grams of weight when leaving the water. This would take some getting used to. He could feel that familiar bloated feeling and the tightening of his skin. This time he would have to molt on land, but he used a similar strategy. He buried himself deep into the sand so that no predators can find him when his skin was still soft. He blocked the entrance with his large claw, partially for protection and partially to keep the relative humidity in his burrow high which would be very helpful when shedding the old skin. When he finally emerged, this time after a couple of weeks, the sunlight blinded his heavily faceted compound eyes. He looked down at his shadow and was surprised by the growth of his body. He instinctively went to pick up the coconut shell he'd been dragging around with him, but then he realised he'd grown much larger and his skin was much tougher than it used to be, and he was no longer as reliant on the shell or covering of his body that he used to be. He decided it was time to let go of the shell, and use his powerful claws and toughened chitinous skin to protect him. After a brief moment of anxiety, he crawled out of the burrow and left his coconut shell behind. He quickly found that he could travel now for hours on land without any problems with breathing while searching for food. He actually had more problems spending any significant amount of time underwater. His instinct prevented him from drowning, which is what would happen if he spent more than one hour underwater now. The reason for this is an interesting adaptation that sets many terrestrial hermit crab species aside from other false crab species. After their transition into adulthood, they must leave the water, and the gills which they relied on previously for oxygen exchange in the water are replaced by branchiostegial lungs. These lungs run laterally along the thorax and must be kept wet in order to function properly. The hermit crabs use their legs to channel water into these lung-like organs to achieve this. These lungs are not like our own. They open at the sides of the body rather than through any kind of mouth. This remarkable adaptation is most likely a consequence of the huge competitive advantage associated with being able to travel on land. In addition to taking yourself away from the numerous marine predators that would like to eat you, there are a whole host of new food resources to exploit. Coconut crabs are considered the most terrestrial decapod, returning to the sea only to spawn. 243 was about to discover a resource after which his species is named. He was scavenging along the beach amongst a crowd of smaller species of hermit crab, and in the middle of eating a rather unappetizing pile of rotting seaweed pods, he smelt an incredible alluring smell on the wind. The way he smelt food had also changed since he left the water. Previously he'd been using his antennae which ended in specialized organs called asthetasks. These asthetasks are essentially hairs which are highly sensitive to detecting hydrophilic food molecules in water as the current flows between them. As we mentioned earlier, crabs use a rapid downward stroke which catches a new sample of water and a slow upward stroke which holds the sample for analysis. This is no longer possible when they leave the water. Instead they analyse samples continuously as air flows around the antennae. When they flick their antennae it increases their sensitivity to smells by about 21% compared to keeping the antennae still. Their antennae are particularly sensitive to detect coconuts, bananas and rotting meat. 243 started to follow the smell of this ripe coconut, which was drawing him away from the rotting seaweed pods. He flicked his antennae for directional information, and as he approached the base of the coconut palm tree, he noticed the floor was littered with coconut husks, but nothing to eat. The fresh, ripe coconut smell was coming from above, and he used his giant powerful claws and legs to pull his now 2 kilo body up against gravity to the top of the tree. He moved like a heavily armoured robot. He was incredibly strong and used all five pairs of legs to spider his way up to the top. It was very slow, it took about 20 minutes, but when he got there he was rewarded for his efforts with numerous coconuts. He snipped through the branches easily with his claws which were now large enough and powerful enough to crush bone. 
In fact, coconut crabs have the strongest grip force in the animal kingdom. It's been shown that they can exert a crushing force of more than 2,000 newtons, which is 10 times stronger than the claws of the largest lobsters. They probably evolved this great strength specifically to break open coconut shells and access the food resource inside. He gazed out from the top of the tree to enjoy a view of the ocean that most crabs cannot conceive of. While watching the waves, he remembered his time in the plankton and momentarily enjoyed a piece of that planktonic tranquility he knew from when life was much simpler. All of that trouble he'd experienced making his way to the shallows was offset by a sense of pride with his own accomplishment, and he felt satisfied to have completed his perilous journey and arrive at a place with very few threats. His only regret during the journey was that he had not kept more of that peaceful planktonic feeling throughout the experience. But regret itself was not the way of the plankton. He freed his mind from any such notions and felt gratitude just to exist. He relaxed a little bit too much and lost his grip falling out of the tree among the coconuts he'd cut earlier. He landed with a thud and noticed with shock that another coconut crab had already started eating the coconuts he'd cut out of the tree. He raised his pincers and got ready to do battle and then he recognised that this was the thief. His anger dissipated very quickly when he realised that the thief was actually a mature female and he immediately reconsidered his future plans. Over the next few weeks she would carry their fertilised eggs on the underside of her abdomen and as soon as they began to hatch she would enter the shallow seawater to release them into the planktonic clouds. 243 had combined both luck and hundreds of thousands of years of evolution to survive this perilous journey of the sea and in doing so he would contribute his genes, the blueprint needed for this remarkable journey of survival, into his hundreds of thousands of offspring. With a bit more good luck, a few of them would reach adulthood. And that ends the tale. So in this episode we learnt about what plankton is, the difficulties of surviving for young decapods and how their adaptations have helped them. We learnt about the way hermit crabs exchange their shells in these vacancy chain events and how shell quality impacts their chances of survival. We also learned about the special adaptations that coconut crabs have to allow them to emerge from the sea and live a terrestrial life during adulthood. I thought this species was worthy of a tale because of its extraordinary life and the unusual features that it has. The fact that a relatively simple organism like a crustacean is capable of using what is arguably a tool to increase its chance of survival is very fascinating. I also chose the species because of their immense size and strength, and how unlikely it is for them to survive the whole process into adulthood. I want to thank you all for listening, and if you're enjoying these stories, please be sure to subscribe. And if you're in a position to do so, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Any small contribution is very much appreciated and will help me to make these episodes more frequent. To do this, click on the link in the episode description. See you next time on Tales of the Wild.